right. Well, I'll introduce Tom, even though uh, we're all pretty familiar with Tom, but for everybody watching at home and the recording. Um, mm -hmm. So Tom Fecto is going to be our speaker tonight, going to be telling us how to cash in our side hustle. I know I've got a couple of projects of mine that I would love if they made money, but I don't spend the time on them. I don't organize them in the way that for them to do so. So I'll introduce Tom briefly. Uh, he's the owner and operator of Epic Ventures Group, uh, coaching and mastermind group facilitator based out of Syracuse, focuses mostly on SMB small businesses throughout upstate New York. Uh, Tom's been working hands-on in the startup business for over 25 years, does a ton in sales, uh, coaching and mentoring, um, basically from small businesses on up. So he's got a ton of knowledge and experience, and he's going to share that with us tonight, which is going to be great. Um, you know, he loves working with entrepreneurs specifically for, you know, people that have ideas, they want to make them into a reality and, uh, the best ideas are the ones that make money. Um, so I'll, uh, Very with good. that, I'll, I'll, uh, turn it over to Tom and, uh, looking forward to hear what he has to say for us tonight. Sure. I'm curious about your definition of what cashing in means now for a lot of different people, it, it might mean, you know, doing good for the world. Um, it could be something as profound as, you know, coming up with something that would uh, help a doctor, uh, you know, come up with a better pre prescription or treatment plan for a cancer patient, you know, and the technology that's actually being developed for those kinds of things. So exciting. Uh, but when you get, when you get down to um, the pieces of uh, what's going on, why are you doing this? I, now I don't know each of you, but I happen to be a, a person who's a fan of the Simon Sinek world. Uh, now, Simon, he's really big about the why behind your business, what drives it. Now, part of that has to do with passion, but part of it has to do with once you have that clarity, the decision making to move all the components forward to begin to get a bit easier. Um, conversely, um, I've run into this before, and this was related to some of my early lessons when I began working with other businesses. It had to do with, you know, what was how broad a definition of success people would bring to me. And now some people would say, I'm, I'm here to make big bucks. You know, that's what it was all about. Uh, by the way, that picture, that's what a million dollars and a hundred dollar bills look like. So if you ever were curious and you wanted to have a million dollars one day and have it in a nice big bundle, it's going to look like that. Um, but interestingly, uh, one of those first lessons I got along the way was that people who had a mission, who had um, almost like a greater good or something that was very meaningful to them to start with, um, were able to make all the other pieces work harder. And the people who were there for, I think this is going to be a great cash cow. And that was their start point. I got an idea and I immediately figured out, you know, tried to figure out the monetizing and I'm always focused on the monetizing. Um, it has its place. I mean, why get into business if you're not going to monetize it at some point? But when that became the ultimate driver, when that was really the ends and the means uh, and the driver to everything, very often that's when I began people watching people make poor decisions when new resources were needed, conflicts would pop up. Uh, much of it, you could be summing it up as almost like too much short-term kind of approach to, to things because it needed the quick result. So you have a side project and Doug, you even mentioned you have a side project. Um, some of those side projects can be something that don't have to have great meaning and have great package, uh, passion behind it. Uh, uh, I've got a buddy, for example, who just wants to make a little side money and, you know, have some better vacations for his family. And, and that's what his side hustle is all about. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be grandiose. So I'm wondering, you know, has anybody got a, a side hustle that they could kind of share with me and, and bring, bring to the group? So I basically work with medium to small businesses, usually restaurants or solar, solar entrepreneurs, like, you know, the guy that delivers mulch or does tree services. And I look for people that 
are really good people that I like working with. They're great. You know, they show up on time. They do what they say they're going to do, uh, which is a nice uh, rarity in today's world. But uh, but their websites are mm-hmm. terrible, or they don't have one. For example, one of my uh, one of my favorite yeah. restaurants in Greece has a horrible website. Every time I go on it, I can't even read their menu. So I reach out to them. You know, I say, hey, I'll give you a website for X amount of dollars. I do it, um, and I make a couple thousand dollars a year doing that. But for me, it's it's mm-hmm. fun money. It's being able to save money for home improvements. It's basically just a side income for me. Um, but I would really like to make it more efficient and have a funnel of of people coming in rather than me just stumbling across, uh, you know, bad websites every now and again. Okay. Um, well, what would be the what would what would be the reason to to want to, I mean, because we know it's going to be a little more time and energy, you know, take some more resources. Uh, so what would, what would be the tipping point there for it to say, you know, yeah, maybe that's worth putting some more time and energy in. Would there have to be like a, a potentially bigger payoff, um, something more interesting, you know, maybe the types of websites you were doing, what would, what would that be? Probably volume. Uh, you know, right now I don't even make enough to make it worth, you know, establishing my own LLC, for example. Right. I do, I do three to Mm -hmm. five, I do three to five a year. Um, and enough mm-hmm. for a vacation back when we were allowed to travel um, or it's enough for, yeah. you know, me to, to buy stuff basically. So mm-hmm. the motivation would be volume for me. If I could get that funnel and that that's, you know, I haven't just put in the time to do that yet. Okay. And how much, much how much time and energy do you think that would, I mean, now that you play with it a little bit, what would, I mean, how, what would be the incremental? I would say probably, 10 to 20 hours a week would be reasonable because I use a template, right? So I can swap logos and colors. I'm not building you a custom Mm -hmm. thing from scratch. Then I would have to give you a quote, right? But just to have a mobile Mm -hmm. ready website for most people, you know, that's, that's a Mm -hmm. mind boggling (laughs) experience, right? They're, they're going on Wix or they're going on Squarespace and and they're trying to quote build it. But if you don't, you know, if you don't know what it's supposed to look like, it's hard to, it's hard to do it. So I couldn't, uh, been, to, been through that personally. So <laughs> needed to, needed to meet you sooner. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, okay. So, so the sale, so you got the, you got the production side and, and then you've got the, you know, go finding them. But I would, I would have a suspicion. My gut says with the few that you've done, um, it's going to be easy to fairly easy to, to be able to have that, um, the testimonial, the the backing, the ref- I don't know that you'll get references necessarily because again you're looking for those with bad ones and not everybody necessarily knows somebody would they would even know had a bad website or cared so that'd be a little tougher um, but that's but is that part of your ten ten to twenty hour bucket is the pursuit as well as the execution yeah for sure the execution would probably take me maybe maybe five hours total to build someone a site um but the execution okay. on that would be okay. not too bad not too bad all right so again you know the hows you know the where's you know the payoff for it i'm, I'm curious a- anybody else have a have a little short story to add to it because that's a that's a nice that's a, what i would call like an incremental true you know um you know side hustle all right uh, somebody's some people's side hustle is sort of like that incubator start of an idea, but they actually have kind of a bigger, you know, something they want to take and they want to even go bigger. But regardless, who else has something? Uh, oh. So um, I don't know if it's the bigger idea that you were you were necessarily hinting at there, uh, Tom, but um, something that that I mm-hmm. truly enjoy uh, are, are speaking uh, engagements. So I I wow. love. Um, networking. And I think a lot of people don't um, either know or feel comfortable doing it or um, necessarily know kind of what I deem as the proper path for networking. They see it as handing out business cards, standing in a room with a, uh, with a name tag on. And I have a very different view methodology and value of networking. So I, I enjoy um, you know, uh, here and there getting to speak, 
um, now virtually, but I did a, a, a small, mm-hmm. small handful in person before this all happened, um, teaching whether it was college kids, kids or um, individuals looking for a job, um, how, to, mm-hmm. how to, in my view, properly network. All right. So um, this uh, potentially, is, is this done to basically give back and help help everything work easier? Kind of like, you know, I know the, you know, startup grind, you know, Rochester and so on. You know, I've learned from a lot of those folks that, you know, their purpose is to put their time and energy and help others succeed. And they're not looking for a lot of personal reward. Now, some people have, you know, investment abilities and that's, you know, that's also free for everybody to pursue, but a lot of it starts with just want to help. Now, is that a help thing or is that a, you're getting paid for it? Currently it's a passion. I I love networking. I have, I have not gotten paid for any, uh, any of the, uh, again, small handful of speaking events, but it's just a passion of mine. I I love people. Um, and I just enjoy teaching others kind of about my passion and and how I think they could succeed at it. I'd love, eventually I'd love to monetize it. But, you know, right now I do it because I love it. Okay. So, all right. So, so maybe where you're at in this is you've got something, you got the itch, right? Got the itch, need scratching, and it could have a monetized element to it. And I, I, I know, and I've heard, and I've watched people, as a matter of fact, not too long ago, I participated in something where um, somebody had said that, you know, he had a couple of keys to this you know, video life we're in, this virtual life we're in and how networking, you know, tweaked a little bit in it. And uh, it didn't have anything super magical, but it was a good refresher for me and made me think about being more conscious about those events. And, you know, that's what he does for a living. So if so if he could do it for a living, I don't see why you couldn't do it for a living. I mean, just my own opinion. Sure. I mean, you, you have a lot of that kind of core talent you have to have. You got to be personable and, you know, voice and the you know the persona to be in the virtual world so um so if it was something you wanted to monetize it you could so it's it's something where okay you need to be in that kind of early stage of you know let me think more about it what would it take what resources would i need Mm -hmm. so uh is that something you were you were thinking about getting more serious about or you just wanted to maybe just do a little more speaking first as as this whole thing hit, and I'm not blaming it on COVID, right? Because it's it's my own fault for not pursuing it more. Um, but as the whole thing mm-hmm. hit, um, I was starting to work through and try to figure out, okay, how do I actually contact and who am I contacting to sell myself, right? To to actually get in front of. Mm-hmm. So I was starting that path, and mm-hmm. and then um, this came, and I just I just shut down on it. So I was at that point of trying okay. to figure out the for lack of a better term, sales process, right? Whether that's money or not money, there's still a sale that has to happen Mm -hmm. there. Oh yeah, because somebody's got to give up time. You got it. You can never, there's always the time side of the form. You got it. Yeah, that's something that, you know, is is doable with a little time and effort. I'm going to just go with a gut guess here and think that when all this stuff slammed on us back in March, you probably had to figure out how to take care of your primary means of living, you know, first. You got it. You know, and get that, figured out so yeah so it sounds like you're at a place where kind of you now have that uh, um kind of stabilized enough you know you, that you have some confidence and you know comfort in that you know life will go on the sun will rise tomorrow you know money won't disappear um yeah. you know you're going to be okay yeah well and, and i think there's a I, new there's a new version of it as well right because before people thought they knew what networking was and knew how to do it now it's almost even mm-hmm. more interesting because people are like well how would i even network now that we can't get together so there's there's, Mm -hmm. i've also been putting time and thought into that of how do i teach people how to how to go down this virtual networking path but yes you are on the right path with everything you were saying too as a side like i said i didn't know we'd we'd fall into this uh this uh, out of this conversation um quite frankly i was wondering if there'd be more people that'd be a little stronger on the you know, I want to make more money. I want to make, <laughs> but we've got, we got folks that, uh, Hey, it's, it's a true, that's the thing with side hustle. You kind of have that early stage where you're not sure where things are going to go and how far do I want to go with um, it? Um, Tom, so, so you need that growth space. Tom, hey, oh, ben, I want to make money. Yes, go, ben. <laughs> or, oh, hell yeah. I, ben. I mean, that's yeah, my you're... business model. Make money and do good. That's my model. That's my business model. Anyway. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I've and I've learned from you, Ben, that um, you know, you were really motivated by the good do good part, right? Yeah, but I Which gotta is, I gotta uh, make money first because I gotta pay I gotta well, support it, my business. So anyway, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, again, um, you you've you've shown me that balance on the of the success on the left, you know, being being nice and moderated, and and you know, you haven't gone and done any any crazy moves so far in your, in your excursion. What first lesson that I'd learned along the way after meeting, you know, again, hundreds of entrepreneurs with, with lots of interesting ideas. And I've even found it, you know, when I found the folks that had the, you know, the little startup ideas, the, Hey, I wonder if this can be something someday. Some people that they didn't really ever want it to be anything big. They like, they like their primary job and their way they make their living. But the, the folks that had the greater why, um, and stayed focused on that, always were able to make the, they did a better job overall making the decisions when tough decisions had to be made, all right? That was an edge. And now maybe it was the world I was in before, but um, there was, I ran into a bunch of folks who the main reason they got into the profession they did you know, when I found them and they were beginning to ask for advice and help because things weren't working the way they wanted it to, is that, you know, I would ask them about the business and their description of their why was always like, yeah, 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 I got this purpose, but that's that's just my means to my money. And that, I'm not hearing it in today's audience, and that's good. And as I mentioned, you folks aren't likely going to be the greatest recipients of some of these lessons today. but there are folks out there and you may know some of them where um, they're driven a bit too hard by money and it's distracting them from the ability to think about the business and make good, make good decisions. So that's something that has to be watched for. That was kind of my first like Achilles heel, uh, you know, leaders making mistakes and they couldn't see why. And it, you know, and it just started from, you know, what direction are you heading in this business? Tom, would it be fair to say you, you use this word one time, but purpose, would this be fair to say, um, yes. find a way to live a purpose driven life? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, you know, Matt, you've, you've shown us that many times and myself personally, in some of our conversations, uh, I happen to be a, a Simon Sinek fan. Yep. Start with one. And, uh, you know, in terms of the modern leadership, uh, it's somebody I follow closely and uh, I have to concur with something that I saw in sort of the, like the unintended consequences phenomena, which is, you know, and he talks about how in the financial world, when it, when the purpose of businesses became, and it was, ex- became culturally accepted that the reason why a business exists is to maximize profit, right? And when, and when the purpose of a business became money, um, you already had enough stories over time about egos of, of, you know, great names in history who, you know, uh, got consumed by money. And that, that falls under the category of, you know, when power, you know, becomes so great, sometimes, you know, good people then get distorted. But, uh, when, when your mission, when, when you decide culturally that everything is going to be money driven, now you have these, this unintended consequences and cascade effect of, treating employees not very well. You don't, you know, you change your approach to your products and services and your customers, and you try to figure out how to make the cheapest thing. Um, and so, you know, though, and everybody gets to have this now, this throwaway society. Um, so, you know, so you have to watch that stuff. So I, I concur, Matt. Very I would, much bet, so. you would, so I would again, bet you would find this in big corporations where you could say something like, look to maximize your utility of purpose rather than maximizing your return on investment. Mm-hmm. Something like that. And something like that. But um, again, now that's where you get, you get down to the yep. leader. And it's tough to take a leader who's going to be highly incentivized, you know, in the bigger organizations <laughs> with real big incentives <laughs> to, uh, you know, reconsider some of that. Uh, so, uh, but within all us, within our world, you know, we, we know some folks who've started some companies, they've had some successes and, and kind of that grind of, you know, when's the money going to come in, uh, sometimes gets in their way. So, um, 
just make sure you don't fall into that trap yourself along the way. Uh, now, this is, uh, I found as, as I researched and began to look at all the different models and ways and phases that, you know, startups have, and there's tons of books out on there, and they all have a little tweak or different. I just decided to go with this one. Uh, and so what we have now is this phase approach of product, you know, life cycle development, business development. And in the lower half, uh, and I had just happened to like William's words. I'm, I like sometimes having some short, sweet words and just say nail it and scale it. I, I kind of like that. Uh, that's my style. So when you're figuring out how to get the thing to work, all right, so you've got these ideas, you've got these little side hustles, you're figuring out what's going on. Then you start to look at the marketplace. Is it something I can really replicate? And, and there's lots of systems and processes that can help you do that in a more formal way, right? Versus, ah, my gut says, you know, I can do so much or there's so much out there or whatever, you know? So now there's some discipline that starts to show up. Um, good friend of mine, uh, I've been with him, I've been a friend for about 20 years, Terry, um, very mechanically inclined fellow. Um, his side hustle is uh, taking on small engine, uh, motorcycles, mostly off-road, you know, does some street bike stuff, but mostly it's off-road things, four-wheelers, snowmobiles, uh, play toys. And a couple times he's come close to actually formally, for, formally starting a business. And what keeps kind of getting in the way, not what does get in the way, is he, he won't go to the discipline part of figuring things out. Uh, he just kind of looks around, kind of knows what's happening in the general marketplace, and then just kind of makes his own call. And so he gets close to it, and then he stops and he backs up again. Now, I really don't know if that could be a great business because we've not done the analysis. But I, I think if we did, he could stop driving himself crazy, saying maybe it is because it, it, it keeps recurring. It comes back again. So th my point is, is there are tools and structures to help you through the early phase, all right? And then once you start to get to a scale size where you start getting more people involved, that, then the complexity starts to kick in, right? So, you know, if we're doing something kind of all by ourselves, it's kind of in that solopreneur world, eh, you know, sometimes we can, you know, if we're willing to just keep it as a side hustle kind of thing, we're good. Now, if it's something that we're, we want to replace our main job, uh, eventually that that's, that structure and process is going to start bringing people in. You know, it's going to be, be more demanding that we actually follow that stuff. Um, what I want to really take it to is start to think about the factors involved in being successful. Now, this is kind of a might be a backwards way of looking at things, but I ran into this study here from uh, CB Insights. Uh, some of you may have seen it. You've probably seen many others. Uh, this one I found kind of interesting. And it was a, a survey. I, I wasn't able to find the details as to exactly what they were asking and how the data was gathered. But here it was being published. You know, somebody's going to look at it and say, ah, you know, what great wisdom and so on and so forth. Uh, what I hope some of you do is when you run into these kinds of things and you're trying to, you know, learn from, get wiser at business, you know, take life and its lessons and then say, okay, go back to your other side hustle and say, okay, what, what, what should I watch out for? What should I be thinking about? You know, when do I need to be more disciplined? Um, I was looking at this and noticed that um, now this is one of those, those things that, uh, when I mentioned before about uh, asking why and, and having that as, as the key to, to trying to understand things, you get a chart like this. This thing shows up, catches my bright, shiny object eyes. Uh, don't know if it's interesting to you. I, I hope it is. Uh, but when we look, when I started to look at all these categories, I started to put them into groups because my brain needs to kind of organize things because I'm on the hunt for patterns. I'm trying to figure out groupings. And what I started to notice was there was a whole bunch of items here 
that really boiled down to and were related to their whole uh, market analysis. You know, what was the potential? You know, where where was the, where could this thing go? Who are we really going to serve? How many folks out there are really going to need what we have? There were there's variants of it, and as you scan down through it, you'll see. I'm not sure how well it shows up on your screens. Obviously, if you're on a small monitor, it's probably not a, not a clear picture. I apologize for that. But you'll see ones that are very much, they should have had a way to catch that early on to say, you know what, this probably wasn't going to be such a great idea. Um, and again, not knowing where the research was, I'm I'm hoping that what I'm looking at is companies that, in some cases, decided to pull the plug quite early. All right now, some of these things that are on this list, um, as you see in my caption there, cause versus sy symptom. You know things like running out of cash, all right, uh, getting out competed. I mean, uh, all right, that that may have been a reason given by someone as to why things didn't work out, but I think that natural three-year-old brain that. I think all of us have a piece of to ask why. Now, how could that be? Is that is that even that, what what's behind that? All right. And so some of those it can get a little nebulous. You you wonder what was behind it. But again, on a bunch of these, it looks like poor planning at the start. Looks like somebody got a hot idea, um, th threw money at it. Probably their own or their families, as many startups often are made up of, and. You know, it never was able to go any further there. They either maybe lacked the skills and the discipline to figure out how to interact with investors. Um, again, investors comes up in multiple places on this. Um, so again, did they really have their discipline together? Um, now, this would be for a company where we're moving it past that, you know, um, just a little bit of extra money kind of deal. But the principles still apply, right? Um, you know, Doug, I, I, I want you to, you know, be able to put in a little bit of extra time, get that little bit of extra money. Hey, family, cool thing. All right. So to take time to even give just a little more discipline to the planning side, you know, might turn out good. Now, what's also interesting here is the number of items that are related to the team, the people. And I thought that was very telling when you added them all up. So there were things that were better processes probably could have helped some of these company, but it looked like an awful lot of people dynamics. Sometimes it was the leader by some of it, you know, the burnout and the lack of passion, things like that. But, you know, how do you, how do you end up with uh, not the right team as such a high percentage? Um, now, maybe that's my bias because spending so many so much time and so many years and trying to help companies figure out how to get the right teams together. Uh, maybe that's maybe that's why that thing stands out and kind of rubs me the wrong way. But there's multiple people oriented things going on here. And so I, th I think what that really leads us to is that whole th the whole thing of, you know, you got these reasons, but. Uh, it looked like a lot of these things, there wasn't like any kind of an early warning system. Um, lot, this is a weird one to most people when I bring it up, knowing when to stop. How many people often plan? Now, I'm not talking about planning to fail. I'm talking about putting some pre-thought into setting benchmarks for when you ought to woe the horses. For when you ought to say, wait just a minute, maybe I should be checking with somebody and saying, you know, have I gone way too far off the rails here? Because too often small business owners, solopreneurs, or, you know, a guy and a couple of buddies, gal and a couple of her friends, when they're moving forward on these things, it's too often for the little inner circle to say that passion that we had for that, that whole business idea sometimes can get in the way of making the those tough decisions. So as you grow it, as you move along and you try to make things go on, have you put any time into the early stages to say what what might
be going on here that we ought to say, whoa. Now, I never thought that way. I mean, for, for years and years and years, it was always about be smart, use your use your head, get around it, fix it, you know, don't, you know, bust down walls, all those kinds of things. And then it was a lesson I really got from large corporations who were doing enterprise sales. And in their sales cycle, I kept running into the fact that um, companies would complain about the investment in pursuing some of these huge sizable deals and the long, long processes and expenses that they went through to do all the testing and the modeling and, and everything that goes on in those situations. And whenever we would ask, well, when did, when should you have thought about stopping, you know, throwing money into basically a dead deal that you weren't going to get, you know, what were your benchmarks? How, you know, do you had anything that you set up in advance so that you would say to yourself, Hey, if these things are starting to line up, we ought to pull a plug. So it was in that world that I finally, you know, for the first time got exposed to the idea of not just planning for success and figuring out how to problem solve and, you know, get over the next hurdle, but to actually do a little pre-planning about when to stop. So that is just something that, you know, came up. That was about a 10 year ago lesson that I got hit with. And since then, anybody and everybody who have at least brought that idea up to, first of all, they, they get a little roughed with it. That's not a comfortable topic. But when they spend even just a little time on it, it gets them ready for handling when the prior slide, when those list of things start to rear their ugly head, when things are starting to look troublesome, you can see it coming. They had a much easier time of dealing with it. So it's not whether you have this criteria and you stick to it real hard. The exercise of giving your brain a chance to think about, well, how will I know if this has gone too far adrift? What should I be watching for? What should I be observing? What should I pay attention to that tells me this idea ought to, we ought to move on. Let's find a better idea. Let's do something else. Um, and that's one where I'm curious of. Some of you here um, have worked for some good sized companies. Um, and I'm wondering if, if any of that ever existed in your world, you know, had, had anybody ever had something like that come into play? I'm curious about that. Um, Doug, if you can, uh, unmute the gang yeah, again, I mean, I, I'm curious about if anybody said that, uh, uh, knowing when to stop. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, knowing when to stop. I, uh, yeah. Or, or, or a team or a team talking about it or thinking about it in advance or, yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you make that? How do you, how do you, how'd you figure that out? So one of the things, this has kind of been an educational experience for myself. And I, I think it's kind of cool to learn through failure and, and to have other people hear about failure. Um, so the second school that I founded, um, which mm -hmm. was some years ago now, it was maybe six or seven years ago. Um, in the very beginning, I could tell from the founding team that there were some, uh, misalignments on overarching vision and purpose and things like that. And I was still kind of at a stage in my entrepreneurial mm, career okay. where I kind of said, you know, like I'm 90, 90% 90 aligned here. There's, there's some things that I view as slightly different. Maybe I can, you know, sacrifice for the greater good or things like that. Um, but I knew right off. Ah, yes, there we go. Those are the <laughs> words. Yep. So, but I knew right off from the very beginning, um, that something was slightly misaligned. And what I found is that I, I stuck it out in uh, running that company, which I was, I became the CEO of uh, gradually over time um, for four years or so, and eventually ended up as a board member. Um, but what I realized kind of part of the, part of the way through the second or third year is that people's visions of what the company would be were thoroughly compromised by what it was that that they wanted on kind of their own side project or their own self interest or whatever else, and uh, okay. it became very clear that there had been 
either an inversion in the overarching uh, priority of, of visions within the company, or that I had correctly identified that there was a vision misalignment from the very beginning, and that that had gradually manifested itself over time. Ah, yes. So kind of one of the, I, I'm guessing, uh, I'm going to now put words in your mouth and I it's apologize okay. if I if I get it astray, you'll you'll fix me right? when I, if I get it wrong. But it's like now you have that wisdom to say, you know what, not only do I have to watch that, but I'm now going to have to keep an eye on it. Yeah. Because I as it drifts, I don't, then the gap widens and yeah. I, I more know that it's something that I have to look for if, if that's part of your point. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that there, this actually happens relatively often, whether it's vision from like a, a purpose definition or from vision for the company or whatever else. And I, I think that it's one of the, it, it is one of the founding goals of the Techner platform is to say, let's be able to rapidly define a, a vision and a product statement and a, a value proposition to do these two lesson mm -hmm. things that you're talking about. One is to have the market tell you when to stop. Uh, and then the other one is mm -hmm. to like expose yourself to people who would say, Hey, w what are you doing? You know, finding product market fit is not always as easy as, as what people would think. Right. There you go. Now, there you go. It's that, it's the brand having those people resources on the outside. So, uh, so, uh, now in smaller, you know, pieces, um, when you, when you're in that, you know, little starting my own thing, I'm passionate about it. You know, just again, if you can have some outsiders popping in and saying, Hey, what's up, you know, have you thought this through? Cause on our own, uh, we may not, we may not notice that the price to pay is starting to get rather high because for us individually, when we're in it, right, it's easy to rationalize and justify a little more incremental. I'll put a little more time in. I'll put a little more of my money in. I'll, I'll you know, we do this, we do that. Uh, and I have actually seen that in several businesses that weren't going well. They weren't dealing with the things that needed to be fixed. Uh, and basically, you know, a lot of hope was really their strategy and, and they just weren't really facing those key elements. And uh, eventually, oh my goodness, the, the price they did pay was, was outrageous for not having some outside set of eyes and, and some metrics on those kind of gray, you know, what some people call a gray area. So what we really come down to is because of people, if you think about back to that slide with the life cycle, all right, all the different elements as as businesses grow. And, you know, sooner or later, we have other people involved, whether it's just a couple of friends and outsiders giving us a hand along the way, or whether this thing starts to take on and become, you know, a real viable business and, you know, big in purpose, and we begin to see some good financial reward on the other end. It doesn't matter. The principle is the same because you're still going to get things done through others, right? And... And that eventually becomes the the real crux, and and I find the most important lesson that's lacking out there, is do people really understand people? We interact with them, but we really don't take into account and really put into systems and processes the people and the communications aspect of things. And that's where I find the the other Achilles heel tends to be in these businesses and where they seem to stumble and fall. And again, why do the ones that succeed and seem to keep going forward? Some people have an instinct for this. I'm jealous of those folks that had an upbringing where they just kind of know and they figured out these things. Maybe parents were good examples. Maybe they had mentors and coaches through life that kind of gave them the right perspectives and things and taught them, you know, in their own little situations, these things. Um, this was my Achilles heel. When I say that in my early days, I was lacking, you know, the ability to take the lessons and translate them. It's because I didn't know any of this stuff at all. Um, the people just, I just, my summation was people, why don't you just listen to me? And why don't you just do things my way? <laughs> now, let's just say that would explain a lot uh, for those early crashes. Um, and the key thing here is to just know that we're built as a creature, to be habitual, to have habits, to have biases, to make decision-making simple, to take all those lessons through youth. And, you know, we figured out how to survive 
from those little vulnerable kids that we once were, you know, and we get through all the various stages of growth up to adulthood. And now we have these rules about how we need to interact with the world and, and get through things and you know, accomplish what we want. Well, the reality is um, not everybody had those same lessons. Not everybody came up with those same instincts, uh, those same habits, uh, the way they determine trust, uh, how they picked up on biases and their ability to self-control that or intervene, as the case may be, because, again, our brains are designed to execute that stuff on autopilot. So what I found was, is the people who knew something. Now, this is just one science, all right? One of my favorites, but there's many sciences around human behavior, all right? And it really comes down to, do you have a way of knowing why you do what you do? Where do your habits come from? And do you have a sensitivity and an understanding to help you figure out where the other person's habits are coming from? so that you can actually interact in a manner that's useful versus my way, your way. And hey, when we run into somebody where it's the same, we match, yay, we have, you know, we have a teammate or I'll listen to that expert because, you know, some principles, you know, we share in kind. Uh, so, but regardless, you know, do you know some science? So whether it's transactional analysis, whether it's uh, neuro-linguistic programming, uh, discommunication styles, um, filtering systems. There, there's a bunch of sciences around how people filter and, and sort information and store information. There's, there's bunches of different things. Um, it, it's not a matter of, you know, getting the right one. It's a matter of having one. And then are you able to put it into some kind of practice? Because in the end, again, it's, even if it's just as simple as, you know, you're by yourself and eventually you're going to have to find customers at some point or somebody to, as we were talking in our earlier examples, you know, allow you in to just, you know, do a talk, uh, let you come into a website, whatever the case may be, you know, my friend, you know, be trusted to, you know, be handed somebody's, you know, snowmobile to go work on. Uh, you've at least got the customer, you know, interaction. But as you get to be a, a more of a team or in a little bigger enterprise, now you've got your employees or or your partners, your venture people. Um, I mean, I know a few of you because of of some of the things you've taught, excuse me, taught me, is you understand that venture world real well. But uh, as I began to run into the venture world that uh, went across you know different industries, uh, I found many different kinds of attitudes and values within the venture capital world, uh, which surprised me because when I met my first one, I just thought that's the way they all were, right? Eh, instant bias on a sampling of one, wrong, all right? There were some venture capitalists who did take longer term views of things. Yes, there are the ones that are the, you know, let's get in, let's, you know, get a quick turn and then let's get out, you know, quick ROI. So whatever, the case may be, you know, people just aren't cookie cutter. And do you have a way to read people? Do you have a way to, if you don't have an instinct for reading people, not one of my superpowers, um, if you have science, you then at least can have a model for asking questions to figure out what's going on there, All right? Because there's a very simple principle that I, I learned long ago I'll share with you, which is, Everybody acts the way they do for a reason. The reason is whatever was in that, think of that prior picture of the brain, it's whatever those systems and habits and lessons of life says, that's what I needed to do. So I no longer, when somebody says to me, eh, Tom, I don't know, that, that's not really making any sense. You know, and, and they do it kind of in a rough, gruff way. Uh, before, you know, sensitive time would flinch and I'd get all stuttery and not sure what to do. And now I'd have to be trying to think of, okay, how am I going to respond? That doesn't happen anymore. The first thought that goes through my mind is that person thought that that response was totally appropriate. I better figure out why they thought that. 
What is that based on? Otherwise, how am I ever going to have a conversation that could maybe get this at a better path? So that's why I so, so, so much want you to have some kind of process, some kind of science-based human behavior, whichever it, you may stumble into and think may be good. All right. I, rec um, I got a recommendation. So you. again, all right. Can I, can I throw one recommendation oh, for okay. a process out there? Oh. Oh, please do. Please do. That's the whole point. So when I when yeah. I give talks on this, I call this process culture negotiation or cultural negotiation, which is the practice of evaluating what framework you're bringing to a conversation and what someone else is as well, um, which is very important to transaction analysis. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things I would recommend is actor network theory, um, which is actor network yep, theory. Okay. Just something oh, that can see very commonly applied to social sciences, but uh, it's a, uh, it's a very powerful tool of thinking about the the power or enablement of an individual within a larger network of ideas. And it, it kind of uh, has an idea of how things are, how an individual node in a network is contracted with other nodes in the network or with the network as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I thought I heard an acronym. I just want to double check. Did you talk about EMT? A yeah, actor network theory is sometimes abbreviated ANT. Oh, ANT. Okay. Uh, only because I was uh, recently reading about uh, a different kind of therapy um, that's EMT based. So I just uh, wasn't sure if my ears had, had uh, rattled on that one. Okay. So yeah, perfect. Love it. Um, again, because the sciences of human behavior are getting better. Now, transactional analysis one time was you know, poo-pooed as old and not relevant and, you know, got put by the shells. And then it got brought back because nobody could argue that it stood the test of time, but there still is always better. So stay alert on that. So thanks. I, I want to stay up to date. Now I, now I have some homework to do. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. All right. So that's what lesson three is. No people, no understand so that you can answer the question like I've now been able to do. And again, it's helped me immensely in the coaching. Uh, so I don't prejudge. I don't let my biases kick in. I learned to take a breath because my brain will still say, oh, that's because that, that, that. I now have been able to train myself to say, fine, you might be right. But, you know, why don't we ask a question and see if that's true or not? And now my behavior is far better. Now I get to take a moment and take a breath. And so now I just interrupt the bad behavior. I still have the habit. Habits, wow, they're tough to literally break. They At best, you can get them to sit dormant temporarily. But you always got to be on guard for them. They're going to come back. They're live cells in your brain. <laughs> they don't die. Um, not unless you have a brain injury. So learn to have, have something. If, if, it, if you're doing it seat of the pants, I just, again, that consistency and predictability of success, uh, it's going to be a little tougher. You're going to have moments of randomness. Um, I, I have run into people who, in their first business venture, knocked it out of the park, could do no wrong, right product, marketplace, timing, people around them, everything just fell their way. It was beautiful. The good news was they didn't screw it up. All right. They took advantage of it, made it work. And then they're on their third business later. I bump into them. They tell me about their history, about how great they once were. And then I hear about the things that didn't go so well. This so often ends up being what I end up, end up uncovering is they just don't think for a moment about how others might might be thinking what their habits might be, what their values and how they perceive things. Um, and so have something, have a science. Um, and that's just uh, my plug because in the end, how do you, how do you not, how do you not succeed without people? Um, so speaking of just, I'm just doing a little plug here, you know, startup grind, you guys are amazing. I, I've only known you for a few months. Um, you know, what you offer and, and all the other, you know, people that surround themselves and make themselves uh, available to the community. Uh, you guys have terrific stuff. So this whole thing about people, 
um, anybody who is working on a bigger, you know, idea. Um, but even if you're only working on a little idea, you'd be surprised how many people be even willing to help out with a small idea. They're, they're there. Sometimes it's just a matter of asking. But again, people's, people are going to be your your key to success. And again, I'm, I'm grateful for knowing your, your startup grind. So uh, some of you, uh, you may not have noticed it, but in my quick uh, picture of my uh, pictorial resume, uh, racing was one of my uh, hobbies. It's actually my one of my addictions. It's been going on since I was a young man. Uh, this is a photo of back in the day. Um, if you look back in the picture towards the rear of the picture, there's a red kind of coupe squished between two cars on the inner row. Uh, that's my dad's car. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so that has a little meaning to me, but, uh, so that's where my addiction began. Uh, I'm the only kid in the family that caught it. <laughs> so, uh, but anyways, that, that's why the meaning of the, of the cars, but on a, on a more personal note, I'm, I'm curious. I really want to take a moment here to grab, um, if there was something that was maybe reinforced and gave you some additional, uh, confidence to, to act and pursue something, if there maybe was one insight where you're thinking, Hmm, maybe there's something there I should consider. Um, you know, if, if there was, uh, could you do me a small favor, uh, since this is being recorded, either give it verbally, or if, if you want to have a little more privacy, you know, if you could put it in the chat box or drop me an email, uh, I really would like to know if there was some little added value that came out of today's topic. Uh, Anybody want to share verbally? I'll say something cool. Okay. Any Anytime I hear someone talking about um, values-oriented living and, identify, mm -hmm. and identifying uh, both their fit within – their purpose within life, their, their purpose within a business, um, how they apply that purpose to larger goals and – define their interaction with those people around them. I think that's a fantastic thing. And um, I guess every time I hear others speak about it, I am further encouraged in my belief that people in upstate New York have this inherent quality within them that I, I think can be uh, ever louder expressed and be more and more clearly signaled uh, up and out of the region. And I, I think that it's, it's time for us as a region to start talking more about those types of things. Mm, couldn't agree with you more. That's, and that was the, you know, kind of one of the reasons to, to add this. And again, uh, anybody who's viewing this, uh, who wasn't able to make the live event and is, is catching this on uh, replay. Um, this is the, that upstate New York area and, and what I'm seeing happening. It, it's why I'm willing to, you know, throw throw my hat in the ring for help and you know give some additional time and advice to folks um so um i'm, I'm with you completely buddy thanks and I, I again i feel privileged to have met this group because you know, we do share those those values tom um just right. uh, i'll add to the um you know i think when you mentioned simon Sinek and the, your why um it's critical mm -hmm. that you really understand what that is not only for your purpose and to get help you get up every day and put your best effort in. But when you're, if you're a startup trying to pitch investors, when you can convey on why you, why you got into this, why you decided that you're going to fix this problem, mm -hmm. like why, it, why it's big, why, why it's meaningful mm -hmm. to you. If it has some kind of life story mm -hmm. to it uh, can have, can have really big impacts. In fact, some of my people, when they have that type of story where it's so impactful, and, and the problem mm -hmm. is so meaningful to them. It's so personal that they have to solve it. Mm -hmm. That alone will set, you know, so I've seen some investors make, I, the business model has to be still good, but that would be a yeah. big difference yep. maker. So nice job bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, yeah. uh, that, that is that, again, I kept, I kept, you know, I, I didn't have those labels for it, but I kept, I kept noticing over and over and over again. For example, the trainers and coaches that I was working with, the ones who were passionate about not, o not only helping businesses, you know, reach their dreams and goals without having to work harder at it, right? 
when they when they kind of like empathize with the pain of of working so hard and, and literally too hard because that's where they'd come from and to take the sandler tools and apply them to actually make life a little easier and then get the bonus payoff of i mean there was nothing greater in that old world of mine when people would come back and say um i just use those principles to have a really tough conversation with my wife because uh our relationship had been a, a, about heading for the cliff and i use these tools and this kind of reframing of of how to look at her and listen to her and think about you know like the mind stuff that i just you know did ever so briefly there you know the transactional analysis or disc or whatever whatever you use but we taught a lot of different things and be able to come back and say i use those tools i use that that change of thought and the way in which I chose to interact. Now I still had my instinctual actions, but I learned to shut up and do what I knew I needed to do. And now my marriage is in a better place, better relationship with my kids, whatever that is. Um, Excellent. Nothing better. Nothing I got to run. Just, thanks, just, thanks for your we're, we're at wrap up point and uh, I'll do, I will do my, uh, my promise, my, my wrap up for in terms of the things that, uh, I love about Rochester. I originally was a Rochester kid born and raised for the first uh, 24 years of, of my life. And uh, I, I just absolutely through my youth loved the parks. Uh, I was a uh, Culver Road uh, kind of border between the city and uh, East Rondequite and uh, Cobbs Hill and um, oh, Ellison Park and uh, just uh, and going up to Durand, Eastmend and, and so on and so forth. Those things. Ugh. Just absolutely cherish those uh, lilac festival. Come on, how can you not just kick back and and just enjoy that? That that's a rainbow on earth right there. That whole thing. So I miss those. Those were those were absolutely awesome. So with that, uh, Doug, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, you know thank you for giving us the time.